Good morning, friends. Welcome to the uh, 2015 That All May Worship Conference. And thank you for investment, uh, your investment, not only in this day, but in helping congregations all around this region, really to be places where people with disabilities are, are known and embraced, where they are invited, uh, and where they are both having opportunities to serve and also to, to be served as well. You know, the title of this conference is Embracing Inclusion. You can see that up on the screen And so I really wanted to begin the morning by sharing with you something that I think is a critical proposition uh, in our efforts to embrace inclusion in widespread ways. And it's really summarized in a very, very simple statement, and it's this. The church is incomplete without people with disabilities. The church is incomplete without the presence and the participation of people with disabilities. And I want to suggest that unless we're convinced this is true, that essential gifts and relationships are missing when people with disabilities aren't present in our pews, uh, they're not present at our potlucks, in our programs, and even in our pulpits, then we're prone to uh, wander in two uh, ways. The first is that we either overlook altogether invitations to an essential segment of our community, or second, we invest entirely in separate programs in which people with and without disabilities rarely, if ever, encounter one another. And so in my short time today, I I don't have time to go into the scriptural uh, support for that uh, point, but there are more than a hundred denominational statements and resolutions that elaborate on why we ought to be invested in the inclusion of people with disabilities. And if you want to read them all, they're all on our website, uh, www.faithanddisability.org. But I, as a Christian, draw most heavily from those passages that talk about every part of the body being indispensable. Uh, that every person is dependent on every other part, that all the gifts uh, uh, are needed really for our collective flourishing, and that those gifts are given by the Spirit without any distinction for all of the sociological ways that we divide people up. The church is incomplete without the presence and participation of people with disabilities. But I think we've got a long way still to go before that belief really penetrates the more than 335,000 congregations across this country, 300,000 of which I think are in this area, it seems like. (laughs) But if you look at studies that focus on this, you'll see that uh, more than half of all adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities are not involved in a congregation at all in the prior month, Uh, yet more than 80% of people with disabilities say their faith is an important part of their life. We hear from parents that over half have kept their son or daughter with disabilities from participating in congregational life because support wasn't provided, and it's not surprising then that one out of three families has left their congregation because their child hasn't been welcomed or included. We know that uh, less than one-fifth of all congregations offer support to children with developmental disabilities in religious education programs or offer respite uh, programs for parents uh, or support groups for families. And if you want to know more about the research side of this, glad to talk with you about that later on. Um, But I think they all reflect that right now the church is incomplete without the presence and participation of people with disabilities. I think when we're convinced this is true, we start to see that our own flourishing depends actually on everyone else's flourishing as well. I think when we're convinced that's true, we stop thinking about inclusion as a nice thing that we ought to do or that we might do for someone else's good, and we start to see it as essential to the strengthening of our whole community. I think if we believe this is true, then we're no longer satisfied to wait until someone shows up to welcome them. We start pursuing people and seeking out the gifts that are missing from our community, and we start extending invitations widely and wildly. And I think when we're convinced it's true, we, uh, we stop tinkering and trying to retrofit what we do as an afterthought, and we start thinking about our entire community right from the outset, whatever we do in our congregation. So what might be some markers that your faith community is one that truly embraces inclusion and really sees people with disabilities as essential to the flourishing of that community? I want to leave you with just a few suggestions. I think first, in such congregations, people with disabilities, with developmental disabilities, a range of disabilities, are known not only by the people who might volunteer or serve in any formal disability ministry, but they're known well beyond uh, those programs. I think uh, congregations that have embraced this, um, individuals with developmental disabilities are not only known, uh, they're also missed when they're not there. And you know you belong when you're missed, right? 
I think in those kinds of congregations, their first inclination is not to establish programs for people with disabilities. It's to foster relationships among people with and without disabilities. We do programs so often uh, highlight uh, what we see as someone else's needs, but in relationships, that's when we start to see our need for one another. I think these kinds of congregations don't see uh, the needs of people with developmental disabilities primarily as special needs, but rather as ordinary needs that we all share in common. Because a place to belong, a place to serve, a place to believe, a place to become who God has called us to be, these are really universal needs that we all share. Uh, and they really transcend all the ways we tend to categorize people outside of the walls of a congregation. We all have need for one another. And I think fifth, they all point, uh, congregations that have invested in this can really point to multiple examples of people with disabilities sharing their gifts to build up the body. Um, and that means they are able to talk about ministry by people with disabilities as much or more than ministry to people with disabilities. And I think congregations that sort of get this are more apt to talk about the ways in which their preconceived ideas of who is the giver and the receiver, who's the one who has something to offer, who's the one who has something to need. Those static ideas quickly, quickly get overturned. So how can your congregation become one marked in this way? Well, you're in the right place this morning. You're here in the right place this day. So as you listen and you participate in all the conversations that take place throughout this conference, listen closely for steps that you might take, for practices that you might pursue, for stories that you can begin to share, and also for people with whom you can partner, all aimed at helping your congregation become a kind of place that truly sees itself as incomplete without the presence and the participation, uh, without the friendship and the faith of people with disabilities. Thank you very much.